I want to do something. I, I've never done this before in my 39 years pastoring this church, is go back to a previous um, message series that I taught. This is over a decade ago. I preached a series entitled Blessed in Babylon. This past few days, as I was praying a couple of weeks, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me very clearly, you need to revisit this. There's an application that has never been more pertinent than right now. Now, I'm not going to preach the same series. I've given that information. You can find that in some of our archives. But what I want to share with you today, in fact, I call it Blessed in Babylon, the sequel. You know, if Hollywood can have a sequel, we can have one, all right? So I want to go back and use that title and that setting because I believe it's so, again, pertinent right on to where we are. I'm going to open this up today. I'll come back and revisit it in January as we begin the year. Got some other things I want to teach in December, but I want to open this up. I want you to begin to think about this, pray about this, have your heart be ready. Blessed in Babylon. Now, what's that about? This, is, this initially is, is why I shared this series, what the Holy Spirit brought me through, the study of Daniel's life. While he was in exile in Babylon, Daniel was in a place he did not choose. Daniel was there because of the failure of Israel and Judah in particular to serve God. He was in a very ungodly culture. And the, and, and the point that I want to say today, and we're going to look at from some fresh perspective, is this. Although Daniel was in a tough spot. I think it parallels, I'll share, show you in a moment, that, that ancient Babylon has many similarities to our modern-day culture. But in that culture, I want you to get this, Daniel kept his faith in God. It was critical. That was the foundation of it all. But also, Daniel was blessed in Babylon. I want you to understand that we're in an ungodly culture today. We have to say that. I wish it weren't true. I wish that America was in a place of seeking God, serving God in a greater capacity. But we're living in an ungodly culture. We're in it, but we're not of it. How many heard what I just said? There's a difference. We're in it, but we're not of it. It seems to me the church is, is finding itself on two different areas, neither one of them correct. Either the church is hiding from this culture, or the church is wrapped up in hating this culture. People are hiding or hating. This is what Daniel did, and I want you to see. Here's this young man who we begin reading about in Daniel 1 as an exile. By the end of that 12th chapter of Daniel, he had been in that foreign place 60 years. Here's what happened. He not only kept his faith, but God blessed him there. He was blessed in the midst of an ungodly culture, of an ungodly culture, because of his commitment to God. But here's what I want you to see. He not only kept his faith and was blessed by God, he was an incredible influencer. This is what God's calling the church to be. We are not to be hiding now. We are not to be hating now. We are to be influencing now, leading now for the glory of God. It's an amazing life story here that we need to see. Now, it's interesting. I want you to get the spiritual parallels, laying some foundation for you today. Babylon, in the time of Daniel and, and over the centuries, Babylon occupied the land space that is modern-day Iraq. So Babylon of that day was in the same area that modern-day Iraq occupies physically now. It's also important to think about this, that Babylon was there where another place had been, a city, some effort man had done. We read about in Genesis, the city of Babel, where man so became impressed with himself and what he could do that they said, we can make our own way to God. We have enough know-how. We have enough intelligence. We can do this. We don't need Scripture. We don't need God. We'll build our way to God. Well, you know, God had to scatter that. And the nations and the languages came from that. And so here we find Nebuchadnezzar doing the same thing again in the same place, building a worldwide kingdom based on the power of man, the pride of man, the ability of man, creating his own religions, creating his own way to go to God, leading a nation from a corrupt, prideful, ungodly point of view. That was where we have. I believe today, as we look at modern-day Iraq, occupying again the same space. Inside Iraq, let me tell you this, so you, you'll, you'll not hear this, but inside that nation that is, that is violently persecuting Christians, that hates Christianity, that hates the Bible, that hates our faith, inside Iraq today are some of the strongest Christians that you'll ever meet. Now, you'll not hear from them. They're, they're muted and they're muzzled and they're persecuted and they're in prison. 
But over the years, uh, the missions groups that we work with have had opportunity to interact with some of these leaders. These men have escaped that country, silently fled Iraq to go be trained as pastors, are you ready for this, and then sneak back in the country to lead their churches, knowing their life's at stake. Some of the men of our own fellowship have been martyred in Iraq because of their faith. I can tell you that in that nation today, the church is being persecuted because they are winning so many people to Christ. In the face of absolute persecution, there is an underground revival going on in that place. When you look at modern-day Iraq, they probably are the greatest uh, supporter and proponent of terrorism in the world today. It's an ungodly place. Not only are they funding terrorism around the world, they are feverishly working to develop their own nuclear weapons which, listen to me, they will use if they get the opportunity to do that. And so you say, well, Pastor, what does that have to do with us today? I want you to see the parallels. I want you to see that just like ancient Babel, then Babylon, modern Iraq, that there is a warfare going on for the soul of this nation, of this world, that Satan will use everything he can to launch attacks against your faith, against where we are. And I want to come back around and make sure you get this from the beginning. Why am I teaching us this? Why is the Holy Spirit saying, let's revisit some principles? It's this, that in this moment, the call of the church is not to run away and hide. Can somebody say amen? Our call is not to roll up the carpet and hide and hold on. Our call is to stand strong in our faith, allow God to bless us so we can influence for them. Now, Daniel was a unique man. Daniel was taken there, we'll read in a moment, as a, as a young adult, maybe 20, somewhere 18 to 22. And, and we find that, that he comes into this place uh, as a trainee, as an exile. They're going to use him for their purposes. But Daniel is so blessed of God that he serves four succeeding kings. Now, I want to tell you, there is no record in history, not just biblical history, history, of any man who was able to do that. If you think it's, it's messy in America <laughs> to change one president to the next, in that day and time, do you know how one king came to rise over another? He killed that king. He killed everyone in his family. They executed everybody that was a part of his uh, uh, inner circle. And so there were four times Daniel should have been killed. Four times he shouldn't have survived. But something about this man was so unique that it was unprecedented and never imitated since that God so blessed and used this man of influence that he was a light in a very dark time. I'm telling you right now, God is prompting me, prompting us. I believe what God is saying is he's looking for people, families, churches, groups in this day and time in the midst of a modern Babylon that he can so bless them that they will influence for his glory and let his light shine. Now, Daniel was not a priest. He was not of the priesthood. Daniel did not grow up to be trained to do that. Daniel was not in the line of the prophets yet. Here's what I want you to see, and I believe this is where God's calling his church more than ever in this day. Daniel was a governmental leader. He was a businessman. He worked in government, yet there was an anointing on him, a prophetic anointing to write, to hear, to understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit operated in his life. I believe what God is saying, that he's calling his people not to run, not to hide, but go in the marketplace to be blessed in what you do, to bless your job, bless your business, bless your efforts, bless your gifts, so that we can influence for the glory of God. There's going to be intimidation against the people of God, but God is looking for a chance to raise up leadership in businesses, in schools, in government, in entertainment, in the arts, in every place, so his people can shine like lights in these dark places. This is not a time to go to church to hide. This is a time to go to church to be refilled, to be refueled, to have new vision, and go in the marketplace and make impact for the glory of God. That's what Daniel did. It's the opposite of hiding in fear. It's an anointing to stand up and let your faith be seen. And I really believe that that's what God is saying, and that's what God is doing. Daniel was a man of incredible integrity. Church family, I want to tell you, When you stand for God in the middle of a Babylonian culture, modern day what we saw in that day, where we are in our culture, 
you're going to have to be a person of integrity. This is a time for Christians to decide, am I going to serve God or not? Am I going to play church or am I going to be a believer? Am I going to be the real deal or am I just going to try to coast? He was a man of integrity, character, influence, and a man of great courage. When you look at the book of Daniel, uh, there are many prophecies there that are companions to the book of Revelation. It's fascinating. If you're going to really understand the end times and the last events leading to the coming of Christ, you have to study the book of Daniel and the revelation God gave him with the, with the book of Revelation to see how this happened. It's as if the book of Daniel is more, more uh, relevant today than it has ever been. And so we see God speaking. During this year, I've had a lot of people ask me, Pastor, um, do you think we're in the end times? Do you think these are the last days? You know, when we deal with pandemics and things of that nature and unrest in government and society, these are things that, that, that are part of the biblical references to the last days. I believe we're in the last days. I believe we are, we are in a season, and I don't know how long that is. It could be my lifetime. It could be three lifetimes from now. But I tell you, we're rushing toward the culmination of the events we read in Scripture. And Daniel is preparing for us to live in this time. Let me say something to you. God trusted you to serve him in this moment. I won't let that sink in. How many heard what I said? God trusted you to serve him in this moment. This is not the time for, for half-hearted Christianity. But I want to tell you something. Our commitment to God is going to release some very special things. So let's look at Daniel 1. I know that's a lot of background, but I want to make sure we're in context here as we read this narrative. Daniel 1, 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, all right? Now, Jehoiakim, he was the one, the final king in a series of mostly ungodly kings where judgment finally fell. Let me help us with something here. Israel's rebellion as a nation, if you read your Bible, read the prophets, you'll see that God sent prophet after prophet to call them back to himself. Prophet after prophet to say, turn from your sin and come back. And finally, there came a point, I want you to get this phrase, where their rebellion outlasted the mercy of God. It's a dangerous thing. I want to say it again. Their rebellion outlasted the mercy of God. Now, there had been many kings before Jehoiakim that had not served God. But finally, at this place, it was enough. And you're going to read here, what do we read? In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Look at verse 2. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. So what happened here? What do we read? We're, do, God delivered him in. In other words, the terminology is God had had mercy and mercy and mercy, and finally God said, I can't do this anymore. As a parent, you understand this concept, don't you? If your child is rebelling and rebelling and rebelling and rebelling, disobeying, 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 and you keep allowing it, you keep allowing it, you keep allowing it, you know what you're doing? You're reinforcing that behavior. You're allowing them to do that. You're actually condoning it. You're supporting it. There comes a time where, where God said to this nation, Israel, his own people, I have been merciful and merciful and merciful, and if I continue to ignore what you're doing, I'm denying my character as God. Now, church, I know I'm giving you some challenges today, but we're going to serve God and see him do amazing things in our generation. Can somebody say amen to that? We're not going to be the church that gets beaten by a pandemic. We're going to be the church that rises up from this and gets glory, lets God have glory for what we do. Some Christians have mistaken the mercy of God for his approval. Okay? Some Christians have mistaken the mercy of God for his approval. Pastor, what are you saying? Well, I think you understand what I'm saying. There hadn't been an immediate reaction. Israel had king after king after king. And finally, they began to say, he's never going to do anything. God's not going to do anything. We can do anything we want. Nothing's going to change. We've been doing this for a long time. But there comes a point when rebellion could outlive mercy. Then we have to deal with this. This is what happened. God allowed them. God delivered them. God took his, had to take his hand off of them. And what did they do? They took articles from the temple and put them in the temple of their own God. They took the resources of God's kingdom and misused them somewhere else. That's what Satan's after. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Notice who these people are. 
young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So here are these exiles. They are not friends of Babylon. They are captives of Babylon. They are taken there as a group, some say somewhere between twenty to 40,000 captives out of Jerusalem were marched to Babylon. Among them was Daniel and some of his companions. But the Bible says these young men were, were the highest order of the nation. They were nobility. They were royalty. They were well-trained. They were strong. They were healthy. They were handsome. These young men were the target of the kingdom of Babylon. I want you to hear me today. In an ungodly modern-day Babylon, the very thing that Satan wants is your best. He doesn't want your least. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants to steal your best. And the plan is to take the gifting, the calling, the destiny, and the purpose in your life and misuse it for the kingdom of God. To literally steal what God put in us and use it for a foreign kingdom, for the enemy. Let's read what happens now. So what do they do? They taught them their literature. They taught them their language. For three years, they gave them a master's degree in Babylonian culture. The plan was to inundate them constantly, daily, with a false narrative until they shift their faith from God, turn away from what they know, and begin to serve another God. So what happens? Let's look at this. How does it work? Verse 8. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Watch the first thing that happens. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. To Azariah, Abednego. What's the big deal? In Israel, when they would name a child, the parents would pray. The parents would ask God. The parents would speak a blessing. When they named the child, every Israeli baby had a biblical name. Daniel means God is my judge. And so when they named their child, they were doing two things. They were speaking a blessing over that child, and they were prophesying over that child. The very first thing they did to them in Babylon was steal their name, steal their name that was prophetic, steal their name that had blessing on it, and put an ungodly name on them. Every one of these Babylonian names, if you research it, refers to one of their false demon idols. And so what Satan wants to do, hear me very clearly, he wants to steal our identity. He wants the church to lose who we are. He wants us to forget that we are called by God, put on this land for this time, prophesied over and blessed for God to use us greatly. They stole their identity. They wanted them to forget who they were, forget where they'd come from, forget what God had done. Do you know the devil wants you to forget every good thing God's ever done for you? He wants you to forget the faithfulness of God and focus on the moment and still sell your identity, sell your birthright like Jacob, uh, Isaac, Jacob and Esau did. Sell your birthright, Esau. Give it away for the moment. Forget who you are. Forfeit your blessings. That's the work of the enemy. So we see their plan. Let's go to verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Thank God. Here's this young man. I want you to get this. Here's this young man, greatly outnumbered, out of his comfort zone, in a foreign place. And the Bible says he resolved. He made a decision. Are you with me today? Everybody got me? You with me? He made a decision. I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to do this. This is not something I'm going to do. Why? Why would he not eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine? It was a lot more than a health reason. Here was the very thing he knew, that in, in, in Babylon, in ancient culture, every one of their gods or idols represented demonic spirits. The Bible said that. When you're worshiping an idol, you're worshiping a demon. And Daniel knew that if he would eat the king's food, it had been offered to demons. It had been blessed, so to speak, by a demon. And Daniel said, I can't do this. I'm not going to eat from the king's table. I'm not going to do the easy thing. I'm not going to take what everyone else is doing. I'll be the only one, but I refuse to do this. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to keep myself faithful to God. I'm talking about how we're blessed and influenced and lead in this time. Now watch what happens in verse 9. Now God had caused the, officials, the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. 
But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of this. So you see, God had given Daniel favor. Listen to me, church family. Do you know when you choose to put God first, God's going to bring people in your life that will get you to your goal? Do you know right now, I want you to listen to me, if you're caught in this middle of making a decision, do I serve God or not? Do I honor God or not? Am I just going to go to church? Am I going to follow Jesus? Do you know right now, listen to me, right now favor is looking at you, waiting for you to put God first. Right now favor is waiting to meet you in a place where nothing else can happen. Do you know the favor of God is such an amazing thing when we read it? Do you know one day of favor can do more for you than a year of labor? Do you know favor can position you when there's no way you should have been there? The world calls it luck. The world said, well, you were in the right place at the right time. No, the favor of God had you right in the center of God's will. Anybody hear what I'm saying to you today? You and I will never get to where God wants us to go without the favor of God. There are moments of favor. That's not just a word. It's a godly principle. So Daniel first resolves. Did you read the sequence? And then he finds favor. God is waiting to release favor on people who resolve to serve the Lord. Now, this man says, Daniel, I respect you, and I really think there's something about you, but if you come in here and not eat what the king wants us to eat, and you're all emaciated and weak and look bad, and these other guys look good, he says, I'm going to pay for it. So what does Daniel say? Look at this, verse 11. He said to the guard whom the official had pointed over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, please test your servants. He said, let's prove God for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. Do you know your faith can be proven? Do you know that when you trust God, God's going to back you up every single time? Do you know that when you honor God, it can be documented? God can, is faithful to follow his word. So what happens? Look at this, verse 15. At the end of those 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. When you honor God, God's going to show up, church family. Now watch what happened. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Now I'm going to tell you something. If I was going to school or trying to get a promotion in my job, I'd start living like Daniel. You want wisdom and knowledge and understanding and ability to do things you couldn't do? You start living like Daniel and God will start showing up in your life and putting you in the right place. Now, watch this. And not only did that happen to them, for Daniel, there was a new opening of the Holy Spirit in his life. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And watch this. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Nobody equal to them. These young men who had the wrong faith, the wrong language, the wrong ethnicity, the wrong background in this foreign land, if God be for you, who can be against you? When you choose to put God first, there's nothing that can stand in your way. Let's keep reading. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better. Come on, somebody say ten times better. Amazing. He found them ten times better than any of whom. Look at this. His what? Magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. That was the fourth king that he would serve under. I want you to understand something. The battle's always spiritual. It's not just about names, it's about identity. It's not just about ethnicity, it's about the calling of God. It's about God's purpose and his plan and how he wants to bless you. And do you see when God is put first, how he responds? Here's a principle I want to read to you. I want you to get this sentence, write it down, put it down, make a note. We're going to see this in Daniel. There's a principle here that happens in this first chapter. You ready? It's this. An uncompromising spirit open spectacular opportunities for God to display his power. I love the superlatives in that sentence. I want to say it to you again. You ready? I want you to listen to this. An uncompromising spirit, that's Daniel, resolved to serve the Lord. An uncompromising spirit opens spectacular opportunities for God to display his power. 
How many of you want to see the power of God in our generation? I want to see God do that. I want my children and grandchildren to see God's power. I want my coworkers to see God's power. I want this church family to see the power of God. I want those in authority in this nation now to be amazed at the power of God. It takes an uncompromising spirit. Can somebody say amen to that? Now let's think about this. Wow. Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they've got it made now. Daniel's the man. He's the king's advisor. The king's impressed with him. He stays in the palace. We read in the next chapter that that Daniel, because he was a good man, he he remembered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, you guys are getting positions as well. Now look, come on. You, You would say, hey, they made it. They made it. Life is good. They started way down here and climbed the ladder. And Now just relax, man. You did it. You did it. You're the guy. You're up here. You don't have to worry about your life. You don't have to worry about your money. You guys are high officials. You're doing great. Everything's good. And you know, sometimes, I want to help us, some people can only receive one blessing from God because they don't know why he gave it to them. How many heard what I just said? Some people can only receive one blessing from God because they don't know why he gave that blessing. Listen, being a believer doesn't mean you just know what you have. It means you know why you have it. Okay, I'm going to say it on this side of the church over here. All right? I don't know if everybody got it. Being a believer doesn't mean you just know what you have. It means you understand why you have it. Anybody can count what you have. It takes a woman of God to know why she has it. It takes a man of God to know why he has it. So everything's good. Relax, Daniel. Relax, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Everything's going well. But then there's a Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> and in Daniel chapter 2... This King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that disturbs him. And for some reason this time, he goes to his magicians and his enchanters. The occult is what they trusted in in that day. And he says, I had this dream and I'm disturbed by the dream. I want you to tell me what I dreamed and I want you to tell me what it means. And they said, King, nobody can tell you what you dreamed. You tell us what you dreamed and then we'll interpret your dream for you. He goes, no. If you're the real deal, you tell me the dream. And he said, in fact, if you can't tell me the dream and interpret it, I'm going to kill every one of you. You're going to be executed. Wow. Okay? So finally, that gets to Daniel. Daniel's the highest advisor. He's included. Now, he's not a magician or an enchanter working the occult. He's a man of God. And so it finally gets to Daniel, and they say, Daniel, you're going down too. And so I want you to know what Daniel does. The principle I gave you, is that an uncompromising spirit opens spectacular opportunities to see God's power. But here's the pattern I want you to see that makes this thing work for us in this time. I want you to go to chapter 2, and I want you to go to uh, verse number 17. Chapter 2, 17, here's the pattern. Here's where you're going to find in Daniel's life again and again and again that allows him to be used of God in such an amazing way in four different kingdoms, four different times. How did Daniel do what he did? How was God using him in such a dynamic way? How did he respond to this first challenge of his leadership? Verse 17 of chapter 2. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. What's the pattern of Daniel? He was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. Daniel prayed. God spoke to him. He said it came in the middle of the night. Do you know sometimes in this culture, you may have to pray more than five minutes. You may have to get serious with God and pray through the night. Anybody still with me in this message today? See, Daniel was a man of prayer. What's the pattern? Prayer. What did Daniel do under pressure? He prayed. What was his pattern of his life? He prayed. How did he find wisdom? He prayed. How did he know God can answer? He said, I'm turning to God. Church family, there's a lot of folks that go to church but haven't prayed yet. I guess if it gets bad enough, the church will start praying. Come on, anybody with me right now? Maybe we ought to pray before it gets bad. 
Maybe the church ought to have a pattern of prayer that begins to allow God to use us to influence for his glory. But I'm going to tell you something. When push came to shove, Daniel prayed. Daniel had a pattern of prayer. And in the middle of the night, God spoke to him. I love this phrase. I just pulled this one part of a sentence, this one segment of a sentence out. And I want you to look in verse 28 in this same chapter. Daniel goes before the king, tells the king what God showed him. The king's amazed at how this happened. And this is the testimony of Daniel. I love it. I love it. I love it. Look at this in verse 28. But there is a God in heaven. But there is a God in heaven. Daniel, how did you know what the enchanters didn't know? There's a God in heaven. What's going to save your life? There is a God in heaven. What's going to set you up for four times to serve me? There is a God in heaven. Out of your prayer closet, church family, you're going to discover there is a God in heaven. How do you know there is a God in heaven? because through your life heaven comes to earth his will in heaven becomes reality on this earth we need to have a church that knows in the crisis if I'm a woman of prayer if I'm a man of prayer if I'm a church of prayer I'm going to discover there is a God in heaven I'm telling you heaven is open to us right now heaven is listening to us right now I want to have a testimony in America that says there's a God in heaven who visits this earth through the prayer of his people. Anybody with me on this? What's the principle? The principle is that an uncompromising spirit opens spectacular opportunities for God to show his power. And what is the pattern that gets us there? We're men and women of prayer. There's nothing Daniel did that's beyond our reach. There's nothing Daniel did that we can't do today. There's nothing he faced in Babylon that's greater than what we face today. God is able, and he's looking for those moments to show himself mighty and strong and able in this generation. You know, as we'll go on, and we'll study this a little more in depth in in, in some weeks to come, but we go to chapter 3, and there's this prideful, vain king who makes a monument and for 30 days, it's there, and, you know, or, or longer than that. That was the, the, nobody could pray except him for 30 days in chapter 6. But here, everybody that sees this monument, every time you hear this music, you have to bow down and worship it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had the same spirit as Daniel. And they said, if you don't bow down and worship this, you're going to get thrown into the fire. Now listen to what they said. Come on. These are Daniel people. <laughs> These are the people that influence and lead in the Babylonian culture of today. They said, King, we want you to know the God we serve, you know, the God that is in heaven, that told you what you drink, that God, yeah. So, King, I want you to know our God is able to deliver us. Are you with me? But if he chooses not to, we're not going to bow down to you. You know what these young men said? I'd rather go through the fire than lose my faith in God. I'd rather give my life up than bow down and worship a false God. And you know what the account is. He angry and mad and heats the furnace up and throws them into this furnace to be burned as an example in front of the, his kingdom. And what happened? Those three men go in and the king looks in there expecting screaming and howling and death. And he says, I'm counting one, two, three, four. I threw in three and I see four. Do you know what happens when you have an uncompromising spirit? It is an opportunity for God to walk into the hottest furnace you've ever been in your life. See, I may not know how close God is until I walk through a furnace that only God can get me out. If we will not compromise, we will see the faithfulness of God in this time. I know the enemy turns the heat up, but I'm going to tell you we serve the God who is able to walk in this thing. See, sometimes we say, well, if you're God, I won't get thrown in the furnace. (laughs) If you're God, I'll walk up to the edge of the furnace. Then I'm going to change my mind. But we serve the God who's not afraid of the furnace. We serve the God who can save you at any point, at any time, and any place. And what happened to that heathen king? He says, get them out of that fire. You know what he said? Their God's the real God. Their God's the true God. God's looking for a church, for people at this time who are not going to walk away from him, who are not going to hide, who are not going to hate, who are going to stand up strong in the things of God. We could go to chapter 6, and a new king's in power, and his, his attendants and advisors hate Daniel, resent Daniel. Daniel. You know, I heard even a secular news person say the other day, talking about how uh, 
godly person was being attacked. And they said, when did bad become good in our culture? Here we are. <laughs> when did bad become good? Or when did good become bad? When did a good man become a bad man? Just because he honors and serves his God. But I'm going to tell you, they said, Daniel, you can't pray to anybody but this king for 30 days. You know why they did that? Because they knew Daniel was a man with an uncompromising spirit. You know what the Bible says he does in Daniel chapter 6? They said he went into his room, his house. And you know what he did? He opened up all the windows. <laughs> and Daniel got down on his knees, as was his custom, three times a day. And he did what? His pattern. God, I praise you. God, I'm calling on your name. God, the circumstances aren't going to change. You know what I found out, church family? If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if we'll stay the same yesterday, today, and forever, we will see the God of Daniel walk into this culture, walk into your home, walk into your life, and show you how big and strong he really is. That's the God we serve. That's the moment that God wants to create. It's the opportunity that God has for us. I believe right now that God is looking for a church that's not quitting on him, but's rising up in this hour. Can anybody say amen? I believe that out of 2020, God's going to raise up some new Daniels. I believe out of 2020, there are going to be some Daniel churches that rise up. There are going to be places where God shows his spectacular power and shows himself strong. I believe there are Christians who've been hiding. They're going to come up and start leading. Anybody with me right now? I believe there's some children that are going to find the Lord their God, some teenagers, some young adults, some millennials. I'm going to tell you, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, they're going to rise up and say, God, I'm going to stand for you. I'm going to resolve to serve you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to show your power through me. God wants to raise up a new generation of Daniel. We are in a modern day Babylon and God is ready to raise up a modern day tribe of Daniel. I want to lead that church. I want to lead that tribe. I want to be one of those men. And I'm calling on you and I as we close 2020, as we're beginning to get ready for this next year, I don't know what next year is going to look like. Come on, let's be honest. I didn't have anybody forecast what 2020 would be like. Tell the truth. Not even the Farmer's Almanac told you that 2020 was going to be like this. I didn't hear anybody prophesying at the end of 2019. Maybe God didn't show it to the prophets. I don't know. Nobody saw this coming. God did, but we didn't. But here's what I know. There are two forms of prophecy I want to challenge us today. One, part, one form of biblical prophecy is foretelling. Foretelling. A prophet can see this is what's going to happen. This is what God's going to do. This is what the place is going to be like. I'm going to tell you this. There's another kind of prophecy called forth telling, just releasing his word and spirit at this moment. Can I tell you what I believe the prophetic call on the church is right now? If God wants to tell us what's coming next, that'll be God's business. And I'm hearing some things, but this is what I know God is saying. Let's begin to forth tell. Let's begin to let the word come out. Let's begin to let the power of God come out. Let's begin to let the life of Daniel come out. I'm not going to worry about who knows this and what knows that. I'm going to concern myself to have an uncompromising spirit that will release the power of God spectacularly. I want to be a kind of man, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a pastor, a friend, a leader, a brother. I want to be the kind of man that says, you know what? My God's able to deliver me, but if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow my knee. I'm going to see God raise it up. I believe God's going to raise businessmen and women up in this church to new levels. I believe he's going to raise teachers and government officials and leaders and influencers to a new level. I believe there are people that you retired and you thought, I'm done. You just started on the next season of what God's going to do in your life. Now you've got time for God to show up and do what you never dreamed he could do. I believe there are young boys and girls that we thought they're not old enough that God says, I'm ready when you're ready. It's time to see his church become a Daniel church. A modern-day Daniel tribe in a modern-day Babylon. I want you to stand with me. Let's stand together. I want to stand together. I want our worship team to come join me. Church family, I want us to pray. I want us to pray. I want to pray for you that God will begin to stir something in us, something big and bold, something big and bold. I just sense the Holy Spirit tell me there's some gifts. I'm just going to repeat what the Holy Spirit put in my heart. There's some gifts that some have put on a shelf. <laughs> I'm just bringing the news. And God said, you better get that gift off the shelf. Put it back in my hands. I want to use you. How many heard what I just said? I want to say it one more time. There's some gifts that have been put on the shelf. God said, get it off the shelf. 
and put it back in my hands again. I'm about to use you. I'm going to do some things. This is not a time to be afraid. Are we going to have challenges? Yes. Yes. Did Daniel have challenges? Yes. Let me tell you something. You're going to have to become comfortable in being the remnant. You're going to have to become comfortable in being the, the, the core and not the crowd if we're going to do this. I want to say that one more time. You're going to have to become comfortable. I'm part of the core. I'm not part of the crowd. I'm part of the remnant. I'm not part of this thing that everybody's doing. I'm part of what God's doing. God, here's my life. Here's my life. Anybody want to be in that Daniel tribe in this modern-day Babylon? I pray to God that he uses us, that he anoints us, that he uses us big time. I'm, not a, I'm excited about what God's going to do. What did Paul say? He said, in my weakness, your strength's made perfect. He said, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. This is God's hour. This is God's hour. We're ready to do it. I want to do something here right now. For you that are in this room, for you that are on live stream, for you that are going to podcast this, I want you to pray with me, church. I believe right now there are men and women, young men and women, middle-aged men and women. I even since this, this word, I haven't heard this, but one time I said it on an Easter Sunday morning, God dropped this phrase in my heart, and a man who was in his late 70s, who had been away from God for 20 years, came to church that morning on Easter Sunday and was at the wrong church. He thought he was at another church. Watch the goodness of God. (laughs) And this is what God said to me. There's a prodigal grandfather in this church. I'd never heard that phrase, never said that phrase. That man got saved, gave his life to Jesus. I just heard the Holy Spirit say that same phrase to me again. There's a prodigal grandfather listening to me right now. It's not too late. You haven't gone too far. There's some young men and young women, and you're, you're abusing the mercy of God in your life right now. You're abusing it. You're pushing it to the end. I want you to turn to Jesus right now. I want you to come to the Lord in this place. Don't abuse the mercy of God. Don't, don't run over it. Don't, don't take it for granted. Would you pray with me? I want everyone to pray this prayer out loud with me right now. Would you help me? At home, here, podcast, wherever you are, it's your time. Pray it with me. Dear Jesus, I come to you right now, and I'm coming home. No more walking away. No more excuses. I repent of my rebellion. I'm sorry I've abused your mercy. I come home today. I'm not going to wait any longer. This is my day. This is my opportunity. Today's the day of my salvation. I repent. Today I believe in you. I confess with my mouth, you're my Savior and you're my Lord. Come live inside of me. Heal me where I'm broken. Set me free where I've been bound. God, I give you the rest of my life. I give you everything I have. Thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you for one more chance. I surrender everything to you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the mercy of God? The mercy of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, I believe if we'll begin to establish a pattern of prayer, that we're going to come out of these days saying, there is a God in heaven. 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 He's able. Amen. He's mighty. There is a God in heaven. Thank God. Thank God.